The topic for today is Plato and Platonic philosophy. It has been said that all of philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato, and there really is something to this. The reason being, Plato set up a fully formed philosophical system. Before Plato, philosophy had elements of scientific thinking, some religious ideas, and some ideas about knowledge, but the field was still in its infancy. What Plato did was bring all of these ideas together into one single system. The result is a fully integrated philosophy which lives on to this day. Plato's ideas have gone on to influence not only the field of philosophy, but the views of major Western religions like Christianity and Islam. As with all the philosophies we are studying, you don't have to agree with what Plato is saying. The most important thing is understanding what he's actually talking about. If you disagree with his views, that's fine. The key is understanding why you agree or disagree with what he has to say. The reading we're going to be talking about, The Allegory of the Cave, is an excerpt from a larger work called The Republic. For our purposes, we will use this text as a jumping off point to get a handle on Plato's general views. I'm opening here with a summary of the key views we're going to be looking at from the allegory of the cave. It is Plato's belief that there is a difference between perception and reality. And what we are shown is not always true. There are powerful people who want to manipulate you into believing lies. People have a tendency to want to believe what they're told. Truth exists independent of our minds. There is a distinction between the world we can see and the world we can understand. And to know the true difference between right and wrong, we cannot trust our upbringing and experience. We have to use reason and critical thought. I once had a professor who characterized Plato's philosophy this way. There is a moral thread that runs through the fabric of reality. I think this is a good reflection of Plato's ideas. Now, let's talk a little bit about the historical context. Okay, so Plato is officially an ancient philosopher, but when we talk about ancient Greece, we are still talking about a fully formed, civilized society. Athens, Greece, in the 4th century before the Common Era, was a city-state of around 400,000 people. There were farmers and craftsmen, but there were also soldiers, merchants, doctors, lawyers, religious figures, and politicians. It was into this world that Plato's mentor, Socrates, was born. Now, in order to understand Plato, we have to talk a little bit about Socrates. Socrates, depicted here on the right side of your screen, would spend his time hanging out in the marketplace of Athens, talking to different people. He would ask them questions about what they were doing with their lives, trying to figure out the best way of living. He became a public figure who was both respected as well as distrusted. He claimed to be coming from a position of innocence or naivete. He would ask people, why are you the person that you are? How do you know you're doing the right things in life? He would ask artists, for example, what makes something beautiful? He would ask lawyers, how do you know you're doing the right thing? He would ask people about their deeply held beliefs in an attempt to try to understand them. Now, this raises a number of issues. The first being, why was he doing this? One answer Socrates gave was that he had a daemon inside him, spelled D-A-E-M-O-N, that just wouldn't be quiet. He never really felt comfortable with the way things were and was always trying to figure out why things were the way that they were. He was like a little kid who was just always asking curious questions. Here is an artist's depiction of Socrates and the daemon in his ear, pushing him to ask more and more questions. Another part of Socrates' life story is that at some point in his life, someone went to the oracle at Delphi 
This is a, a woman who hung out in a cave and breathed in cave vapors and would have visions. So someone goes to this oracle and says, who is the wisest person in all of Athens? The oracle replied, there is none wiser than Socrates. When Socrates heard this, he was shocked because he didn't consider himself wise at all. It was Socrates' claim that not only was he not wise, but the only thing he knew was that he knew nothing. So being told that there was no one wiser than him, he went around to all the people of Athens trying to find someone wiser. The problem was, when you got down to it with someone, people didn't really understand why they believed the things that they did. Artists painted things they just liked. Lawyers defended clients because they got paid. Religious leaders worshipped the gods because they were the gods. At the bottom of everything, Socrates found a lack of real understanding of truth and how things should really be. The result is that a lot of powerful people in Athens found him to be a threat to their authority. More on that in a minute. For now, a few more things, okay? First, this method of asking people what they think about things is known as the Socratic method. The idea is you don't just tell people things, you ask them what they think. And in doing so, you get people to think things through on their own. This idea that the pursuit of knowledge should be open-ended rather than dictatorial is an important legacy of Socrates. Many teachers use this method to engage their students in the activity of learning, rather than viewing education as a top-down exercise. In this context, Socrates called himself a midwife, a midwife being someone who helps a woman give birth. In Socrates' view, he was helping people give birth to ideas and knowledge that they already had inside themselves. Okay, another way Socrates characterized himself was as a gadfly. This is an insect that flies around a horse's rear end. The horse has to keep swatting the fly away with its tail. In Socrates' view, he was the pest bugging the people of Athens to keep them alert and aware of the ideas they were living under. One of the issues Socrates had a problem with was the Greek gods. If you remember back to what you learn about Greek mythology, you would recall that the Greek gods were not always nice. Sometimes they would kidnap each other, kill each other, eat their own children, impersonate others, and so on. Here is Hades, god of the underworld, who kidnapped Persephone, goddess of the spring, and brought her to the underworld to be his wife for the winter. Now, in Socrates' view, the Greek gods were not good role models for the people of Athens. Socrates believed that if you were going to put a figure up on a pedestal, at the very least, they should set a good example to learn from. So not only did Socrates annoy everyday people with his pesky questions, he also challenged the ruling ideology of Greek society. It was for this reason that Socrates was ultimately put on trial for corrupting the youth. So Socrates was put on trial with the official charges of corrupting the youth. He was asked to recant his challenges to the church authority and apologize for being such a pest. His response was a speech about how the unexamined life is not worth living. In Socrates' view, you had to question authority and think for yourself. If you didn't ask questions and try to figure out the right way to live, you were getting something wrong. He was proud of the way that he was, and he was unwilling to bow down to the authorities who wanted to keep him quiet. Now, the trial was before a jury of about 500 Athenian citizens. And how did this democratic jury of his peers decide? Did they thank him for his efforts to keep Athens aware of their thinking? No. They found him guilty 
and sentenced him to death. The method of execution was to drink hemlock, a poisonous plant. Now, I will say some people call this a suicide, but we should be clear, he was killed by execution. Here is a depiction of the death of Socrates. Socrates himself was defiant that as an Athenian, if his fellow citizens condemned him to death, he was willing to accept his fate. Further, in this final dialogue, in the moments before his death, he argued that he did not fear death because the soul is immortal. Also, you'll note on the left-hand side, there's a figure here listening to Socrates. This is his student, Plato. When we read Plato, we are reading a dialogue between different characters, and the main person speaking is Socrates. Socrates never authored anything himself directly. It was Plato who would go on to put Socrates' ideas into writing. With that historical background in place, we can look at the allegory of the cave. As we read through the text, it is important to keep in mind the following questions. What part of this text are metaphysical? That is, what is being referred to in the difference between the physical world and the world that we cannot see? What is said about epistemology? That's that idea of how we know what we know. How do ideas come into our head? How do we learn about the world? What does Plato have to say about the good? What are the political messages in this text? As illustrated earlier, Plato's philosophy is an integrated whole. The metaphysics are influenced by the epistemology, and these in turn help you understand Plato's ethics. Okay, so let's talk about how Plato's philosophy functions. Plato believes in a metaphysical view of reality that consists of two levels. In front of us is the everyday world of physical objects like tables, chairs, computer screens, and human beings. We can see this world with our eyes, hear it with our ears, but the physical world around us is impermanent. Computers will crash and people will die. But in addition to the physical world in front of us, the claim is that there is a metaphysical realm of ideas and souls. We can tap into this metaphysical world, not with the five senses, but through thought. It is through thinking that we can get in touch with ideas and concepts. Further, since we have the ability to think about metaphysical realities, our minds also exist metaphysically. According to Plato, we have souls which exist above and beyond the physical realm. That is, even though our bodies will die, our souls will live on forever. Similarly, even though physical objects in the world will perish, we will still always have ideas of what can be or what once was. We saw this in our introductory remarks on metaphysics. For Plato, while there are physical things in the world, like chairs and dogs, in the metaphysical world, there exists the idea of chairs and the idea of dogs, and these are permanent and unchanging. This world of metaphysics also includes all of our concepts, as well as things like the truths of mathematics. Similarly, while we have physical beings that exist in the world, according to Plato, we have a corresponding metaphysical identity that persists through time. Plato would call this the soul. We could also describe this as the self. Something to ask yourself is, if your physical body is not the same as it was when you were young, what is the part of you that persists through time? For Plato, it is the metaphysical self, which is an independent identity.
Another layer to this line of thought that is the central question of Plato's Republic is on the question of justice. In the world we live in, there are crimes and punishments, but what is this thing we think about called justice? Is there a real difference between right and wrong that exists independent of our minds? For Plato, the answer to this question was that there is, and it is a matter of having a strong enough understanding of philosophy to be able to figure this out. The consequences here are far reaching and we will get into them as we get further into the text. And let's now get into how the allegory of the cave describes the situation. All right, so as the text begins, we are told about prisoners in a cave who can only see shadows on the wall. They are being manipulated to think that this is all there is to life. They attribute total truth to the shadow play they are witnessing. They go so far as to have favorite characters that they root for. This immediately should raise the question for us, are there people in the world who are being manipulated to attribute reality to things that aren't really real? Okay, so as the story goes on, one prisoner is released from his chains and leaves the cave. As he leaves the cave and sees the outside world for the first time, the light hurts his eyes, and it takes time for him to adjust to his new surroundings. Eventually, he gets acclimated and realizes that everything he thought he knew up to this point had been a lie. Here is how Plato puts it from the text. The visible realm should be likened to the prison dwelling. And if you interpret the upward journey and the study of things above as the upward journey of the soul to the intelligible realm, this is what he is looking at. Now he does let us know whether it's true or not, only the God knows, but he is making the claim that there is something there. So we have a distinction between the visible realm we can see with our eyes, and Plato says this is like a prison dwelling. And if we journey upward and study things above, the soul can journey to the intelligible realm. This is why Plato is depicted as pointing upwards. He wants us to direct our attention beyond our physical existence towards the intelligible realm that exists above the physical. More from the text. In the knowable realm, the form of the good is the last thing to be seen, and it is reached only with difficulty. Once one has seen it, however, one must conclude that it is the cause of all that is correct and beautiful in anything. In the intelligible realm, it controls and provides truth and understanding so that anyone who is to act sensibly in private or public must see it. Again, we have our distinction between the visible realm and the intelligible realm, and it is the intelligible realm where the form of the good exists. In the realm where the good exists, this is where the cause of all that is correct and beautiful in anything begins. There is the idea of something, and this in turn creates physical reality. The idea of things provides truth and understanding, and to act sensibly, you have to understand the good. So how does this work in practice? In order to live a good life, you have to understand goodness. In order to do the right things, you have to have a strong understanding of the difference between right and wrong first. And this understanding comes from an ability to interact with concepts that are independent from our physical existence. For example, to play a song correctly, you have to understand the difference between the right notes and the wrong notes and play them in the correct order. Again, another example in concrete terms. To make a good chair, 
you have to first start with the idea of a good chair. Think of the following phrase, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. For Plato, everything in life must start with a correct idea in order to manifest a good reality. Now, part of the message of the allegory of the cave is that not everyone is able or willing to engage with the metaphysical realm of truth. They remain at the level of appearances and do what they're told and believe what they're told. They don't have a deep understanding of the way things should be, and they follow the directions of everything that is presented to them. Here we have our summary again. It is Plato's belief there is a difference between perception and reality. What we are shown is not always true. There are powerful people who want to manipulate you into believing lies, and there are people who want to believe what they're told. We need to understand that truth exists independent of our minds. There is a distinction between what we see and what we can understand. And to know the true difference between right and wrong, we cannot trust our upbringing and experience. We have to use reason and critical thought. Remember, what Plato is offering up here is that split-level view of reality. As discussed earlier, in Plato's view, there is more to reality than we can see with our eyes. We just have to use our intellect to discover the deeper truths about the world. Plato's metaphysics is called his theory of the forms. According to Plato, things like forms or ideas or concepts are actual metaphysical realities. Here are some examples of Platonic forms. Plato talks about the good, beauty, justice, equality, in the sense of numerical equality, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Oddness and evenness, again, these are numerical properties, and the soul. You'll notice that math plays a substantial role in thinking about Platonic forms. More on that in a moment. But for now, let me just cover one interesting Platonic argument about math, metaphysics, and souls. Plato set forth one argument about the immortality of the human soul by saying that souls are like numbers. Just like the number three can never be even, so too the soul can never die. That is, the number three has the property of oddness as part of its inherent being. Similarly, souls are inherently or by definition alive. Therefore, they can never die. Now, you can argue against this if you like, but what we have to take note of is the fact that Plato is giving us reasons for his conclusions. He's not saying we have immortal souls because God says so. He's using a logical argument. That is, he's basing his conclusions on premises and inferences that a reasonable person might agree to. Okay, let's talk for a minute more about math and its role in Platonic philosophy. A big influence on Plato's philosophy was the mathematician Pythagoras. You may remember the Pythagorean theorem about how triangles function. Pythagoras was not only a mathematician, but he was something of a cult leader. His students believed that there was something very powerful about math and geometry. The fact that math and uh, geometric truths were absolute and unchangeable, but at the same time abstract and intangible, filled them with an essentially religious sense of awe. As Aristotle later put it, the Pythagoreans supposed the elements of numbers to be the elements of all existing things. Now, if you look out into the natural world, you can see mathematical and geometric truths everywhere. Here we have a seashell that has a beautiful spiral pattern. But if you take a square and build more squares out of it and connect the corners together, you can recreate this sort of spiral pattern uh, geometrically and mathematically. 
This is part of what's known as a Fibonacci sequence, a property of the natural world discovered centuries later by the Italian mathematician of the same name. For Plato, physical reality cannot exist as we see it without it first having been thought of in the intelligible realm. That is to say, first comes the form of a thing, and this causes its visible and physical existence to come into being. The thing about math and geometry is that the truths of these subjects are indisputable. No matter where you live in the world, two plus two makes four, and the circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter. Now, how do we know these things to be true? We think them through. We use our minds. Now, where does the number two exist? Where does pi exist? These are theoretical entities. They don't exist anywhere in the physical world. But even if the whole world were to burn up and die, two plus two would still be four, and the circumference of a circle would still be pi times the diameter. It is this absolute truth behind math and geometry that inspired Plato. And it was his conclusion that there were more truths like this that we can discover. Part of the allegory of the cave has to do with how these truths can be realized. It is not that someone comes along and tells you the truth and then you understand it. According to Plato, it is up to each individual to go out into the sun and experience the good for themselves. This corresponds to the Socratic method we discussed at the outset. Here is how Plato puts it in the text. Education isn't what some people declare it to be, namely putting knowledge into souls that lack it, like putting sight into blind eyes. For Plato, if you can get someone to start thinking on their own, they can realize these sorts of truths. Not only will that make it more real for people, but it also suggests an inspiring possibility that every single one of us has the power to unlock deep truths. It is just up to us to start the process. In another Socratic dialogue, there is a story about Socrates testing this idea with a slave. He asked the slave, if I take a square and I double the length of the sides, won't the area of the square be doubled? The slave says, yes. Then Socrates draws the square for the slave, showing the doubled lengths of the sides, and asks the question again. The slave has this eureka moment and says, no, the area wouldn't be doubled, it would quadruple. This aha moment by the slave is something that Socrates believes we are all capable of. And this is how true knowledge can be achieved. We don't need teachers just telling us what's true and we repeat after them what they've told us. We have to experience the discovery of knowledge for ourselves in order to really understand something. Further, the fact that a slave could achieve this knowledge suggests that all people are capable of using their intellect in pursuit of truth. Again, this is a very empowering and revolutionary way of looking at human potential. So Plato is not just talking about math and geometry, although these are important ways of understanding his arguments. He's also shooting for an ethical and political philosophy. In Plato's view, if we can understand abstract truths about math and geometry, then we can also understand the highest and most important truth about the good and how we should be in the world. In the allegory of the cave, the sun is cast as the source of the good. Once we walk out of the darkness and into the light, we can understand the way things ought to be as opposed to the way things are. This idea that there is a better way of doing things, which we can understand if we are enlightened, is now known as idealism. When people talk about a better world being possible or articulate a vision of society that they have seen in their minds, 
they are being idealistic and this is something Plato believes is essential for achieving a just society. This idea of the good for Plato is something that would cut across all cultures and national identities. For Plato, there are just some things which are right and some things which are wrong, just in the same way that two plus two is four. We might call these laws of ethics. A classic law of ethics in this sort of vein would be do unto others as you would have others do unto you. If you think it is okay to lie, cheat, or steal, but you don't want others to do that to you, then you're just being illogical. You might as well be saying that 2 plus 2 is 5. If you think it's wrong to torture people, then no amount of context or circumstances would convince you otherwise. So that is the metaphysics and epistemology and ethics of the allegory of the cave. To know the truth of the good, one must go beyond appearances and enter the realm of eternal truth. But as the story goes on, a political message emerges as well. Once our cave dweller has seen the truth about life, should he keep it to himself? Does this individual stay outside and just bask in the sunshine? No, he feels a duty to go back into the cave and help the others realize the truth of their positions. And what happens when the lone individual tells the cave dwellers that they've been lied to their whole lives and they should break free of their confinement and get out into the realm of truth? Do they thank him for his efforts and go out into the light? No, they feel threatened by this challenge to their worldview and want to kill him. Now, this is undeniably influenced by what Plato had seen happen to his mentor Socrates. But Plato here is capturing a truth about human nature. People are often more comfortable with what they know and see challenges to their upbringing as a threat to be eliminated. What is the picture of reality that emerges here? For one thing, we should be very wary of the fact that people are not only willing to be manipulated by others, but that there are people in power who will do everything they can to manipulate people in their desire for control. We should never fully trust the world presented to us, whether it is through culture, religion, or politics. Plato tells us that we should always be on the lookout for manipulation and keep our guard up against those who would lie to us for their own personal gain. One message here is about the danger of democracy. Remember, Socrates was convicted by a democratic jury of his peers. And in the allegory, it was the group think of the cave dwellers that made them want to kill the lone individual offering challenges to the status quo. Plato does not want us to trust people in power because they can manipulate situations, but he also does not trust people as a group to know the true difference between right and wrong. Plato did not believe that democracy was the best form of government. As we have seen, he made the case that people in general would rather believe what they are told than think for themselves. To live in a good society, we must live in accordance with principles of virtue and justice, and the average person cannot be bothered to understand the true difference between right and wrong. In an ideal society for Plato, we would be ruled by philosopher kings. These are people who have an intuitive sense of right and wrong and have been trained from a young age to think things through on an intellectual level. Philosopher kings are comfortable with the intelligible realm and should be given the authority to know what is best for society in general. In addition to this idea about the ideal form of government, there are some interesting takeaways for us at an individual level. There are both idealistic and pessimistic lessons that can be taken from the allegory. The idealistic lesson is that we should be inspired by the lone individual who challenges people's assumptions, 
Even in the face of opposition, we should stand up for what's right. This is the happy ending idealism that inspires people to lead others toward a better vision for the future. The other more pessimistic interpretation here would be that standing up for what's right is dangerous. Even though we might know that others are being manipulated and lied to, if we stand up for the truth, they might feel threatened and want to kill us. Maybe the lesson of the allegory of the cave is that not everyone is ready for the truth, and it might be wise at times to just keep quiet. I'll let you decide how to interpret the text. All right, there's one last set of ideas I want to talk about here, and then we'll be done for today. As we've covered already, Plato makes a distinction between the body and the soul. Here is how he discusses it in the text. But our present discussion, on the other hand, shows that the power to learn is present in everyone's soul, and that the instrument with which each learns is like an eye that cannot be turned around from darkness to light without turning the whole body. What Plato is saying here is that in order for us to learn the truth about reality, we have to orient the entire nature of our being away from the physical realm and towards the metaphysical realm of truth. This means that we should not get distracted by physical pleasures, as they will prevent us from achieving true knowledge. Now, you might see some similarities between Plato and Buddha and Lao Tzu in this regard. Further, when we get to Christianity, you will see this same idea occur again. There is a key difference here. While Lao Tzu wants us to reduce desires to be in line with the way, and Buddha wants us to reduce our desires so as to reduce suffering, Plato wants us to reduce our desires so as to free our minds to be able to achieve knowledge. Plato believes that if we spend too much time thinking about food, drink, and sex, we won't have any mental headspace left to pursue knowledge. There are many ways to interpret this argument, but there is one movie that comes to mind when I think about Plato's argument that bodily pleasures are like lead weights, keeping our minds from being free. That film is Scarface, starring Al Pacino and written by Oliver Stone. In many ways, Scarface is a moral tale about the potential downside to the pursuit of wealth and power. The film starts out with a group of Cuban immigrants who come to Miami and are living a life of poverty. They see successful people in the street, and they want to have what others have. Tony and his crew begin working for a local drug dealer, and they are on the path to success. As the film reaches its crescendo, Tony has everything he ever thought he wanted, but he acknowledges a sense of emptiness. He is out to dinner with his wife and closest associate, and is totally despondent. Is this what I work for? You get old, you get fat, what's the point? My wife does so many drugs, I can't even have a kid with her. For Tony, a life spent in pursuit of wealth, power, and pleasure has ultimately led to a dead end with no sense of meaning or purpose. For Plato, for us to have a good life, we must start with good ideas. Tony's mistake was to get caught up in the world of appearances. He was so consumed with the desire for power that he never gave himself a chance to understand the real difference between right and wrong. One must understand what it means to be a good person before one can become a good person. One must see one's ideal self in the mind's eye and then work towards making that ideal a reality. To know the true difference between right and wrong one cannot trust one's upbringing and experience. One must use reason and critical thought. As always, I look forward to your responses on the discussion board. We've covered a lot of different ideas this week, so feel free to bring up any of the issues mentioned here. Thank you for your attention and participation. Have a great week.